I'm Edie Lodge and I'm here inside the Hub Culture Studio. It's Davos 22 and I am absolutely delighted now to be joined by Ila Starr. Thanks very much for coming. My pleasure, Edie. So the president of the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. So we have been set back in decades, in some cases, with the global goals. We are facing still a tsunami of crises, war in Ukraine, ongoing uh, considerations around COVID in many parts of the world, rising food prices, inflation, energy prices. So how can artificial intelligence technology, how can we use it for good in order to get us back on track? Absolutely. You're, You're absolutely right. It's a time of doom and gloom everywhere you look. But look, I'm an optimist. I'm not a technology optimist. Mm -hmm. I don't think technology fixes all of our problems, Mm -hmm. but AI does present a chance for humans to take control of some of these problems again. Give us an example. I I think particularly of things like sustainable farmers, Mm -hmm. people who around the world are trying to take care of their families first and maybe think about the environment second. AI gives us a chance to bring those two things together. Mm -hmm. I was with a farmer in a rural community recently and I asked, what do you do to plan when you harvest? And he told me 20 years ago, we went down to the local temple we prayed mm-hmm. and we got an answer. Right. Now I look on an app and it yeah. shows me the local weather patterns. Mm-hmm. It shows me when I can harvest to get the best market price. And maybe most critically, it tells me when I can harvest to reduce the methane emissions from my rice fields. That's interesting. Where was that? In rural India. Fantastic. So I think one thing that that immediately brings up is, of course, the fact that not everyone has access to the Internet. That's right. right. There's still half the yeah. world that doesn't. Um, and that's a very real um, example of what happens when that digital divide gets broken down. Mm-hmm. So in terms of how we might see um, artificial intelligence or technology expanded to more people, any ideas on that? Yeah, a couple of things. Look, I think first at its core, we have to change the way we design these technologies. It can't be we design them in Silicon Valley and we assume they'll be usable in rural Kenya. Mm-hmm. We have to start by thinking about the local technology stack. Sometimes that's not even using phones. Sometimes it's making sure there's one person in the community that has access to the knowledge project mm-hmm. product and can share it out to the community when they need it. The second is making sure we're designing for problems that real people face in the world. Mm. We don't need another social media algorithm. We don't need another way to target customers to buy another widget off the internet. What we need are real sustainable solutions that help food production that limit climate effects, Mm -hmm. that make sure that kids in schools have access to the kind of curriculum that gets them the jobs that will let them succeed. So there's a couple things there. And one is about um, capacity building is a terrible phrase. Let's outlaw that. But it's about how we we give people the skills where they are to build their own solutions. So we have have, um, artificial intelligence hubs in places like Rwanda already, in Kenya, South Africa, uh, Nigeria. What more? How do we get things even more local than that? Yeah, you know, Edie, I don't think about capacity building. I think about transformation of humanity in a digital age. Mm -hmm. And what that means is we have to cite talent in the places where the problems are most apparent. We need to make sure that we're building tools that really effectively solve those issues. And maybe most importantly, we need to rethink our social institutions. We need to make sure that we need to make sure that from a government perspective, from a social welfare perspective, we have people who understand how technology is changing human lives. And we want to make sure that we're furthering the kinds of practices that lead to good outcomes. So federal research dollars, where are they going and what are we trying to build? Are we making sure that our academics are working with our technologists or working with our social change makers in ways that actually lead to short term solutions for the goals? Mm. This is not a 30 or a 40 year journey. In the next five to 10 years, we have to make critical progress. Do you think enough money is going towards this? Because we know that four trillion dollars a year needs to move from richer countries to lower and middle income countries by over the next eight to 20 years in order to achieve the global goals, even if you don't do them by 2030, you still have to get that money there. I don't see it happening. Do you? Do you see that money going? You know, I don't see it happening simply because of kind of uh, inertia. I think there's a way that we can make it happen, though, Mm -hmm. and that's citing economic opportunity in many of these countries. It's making sure that these incredible demographics where you have young people who are so excited to step into a digital generation, have the ability to get jobs and build businesses that force that money to flow. It's about creating economic equality in a world that for a long time hasn't had it. And it's funny how all of these things are tied together, Mm. right? We think about climate, we think about health, we think about money. At the end, we think about human dignity. And we realize that unless you're willing to cite creators with all the resources they need to build tools, we're never going to get that far. Vilas, thank you very much for stopping by the Hub Culture Studio. It's getting pretty warm in here, so we will let you get on with your day. And I'm Edie Lush. Thank you so much, Edie.